everyone to keep their cameras and microphones off throughout the online program. Good morning, everyone, and a hearty welcome to all our participants hailing from different time zones around the world. I am Sneha Bhome, a member of the Geological Institute of the Department of Geology, Presidency University, Kolkata, and I shall be your host for the day. Okay, uh, a few uh, more things before we jump into the actual program. I'll request everyone again to keep their cameras and microphones off throughout the lecture as this is extremely important to maintain a smooth session. A question answer form has already been sent to all the participants via email and the Telegram group along with the shared webinar link. In case you do not find it in our mail inbox, kindly check your spam folder. If you are viewing us on YouTube, please check the description box to find the link uh, for the question answer form. On behalf of the Geological Institute, President's University, I would like to welcome you all to the third lecture of our Geochron 2020. Today, we are fortunate to have with us Dr. Shujoy Kanti Ghosh, who is currently an assistant professor in the Department of Geology and Geophysics, Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur, India. Dr. Shujoy Kanti Ghosh is a well-known experimental petrologist who has gathered remarkable experience from various parts of the world. His primary research interest is to explore the role of volatiles in the deep pantle and its physical properties. Also, his recent uh, uh, his research interest to explore the role of volatiles in the deep pantle and its uh, physical properties. Also, his recent interest is volatile contents, mostly water and nitrogen in man mantle xenoliths and oxygen fugacity of lithospheric mantle. His contributions to earth science have been widely recognized by prestigious awards and fellowships. He has edited a special volume in chemical geology, Elsevier, as a guest editor and regularly reviews the manuscripts of top earth science journals. I would now request our very own Dr. Aurijit Rai, professor in the Department of Geology, Presidency University, to give a bit more introduction about our speaker and to welcome him to start the session. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Uh, as already Sneha mentioned, uh, Shuja is basically experimental petrologist. He did his uh, undergraduate and master's from Allahabad University. Then he uh, went to Japan, where he did his second master's and then PhD on experimental petrology and mineral physics from the Tohoku University with Eiza Otani. And then after his PhD, he moved to Zurich ETH, where he did his postdoctoral work. His main research interest is now confined to the high pressure experimental petrology and role of volatiles in mantle lungs. These two areas are, so far I know, are relatively less studied areas in our petrology and Shujai has attempted. Setting up a high pressure laboratory in our country itself is a commendable job and Shujai has done it successfully and in the process he has opened up scope for the researchers to do high pressure experiments in his laboratory. And the other aspect, that is the rule of volatile in mantle lock, is again a difficult area of research. Because mantle locks are not readily available for study. We only get them as mantle xenoliths and as uh, mantle section of the ophiolite. So, the role of volatiles in mantle lock is again a less studied area, data are inadequate. Shujai has uh, already published, did some work and published his work in very good journal and I hope he will produce more valuable data. Today he will talk on his high pressure experimental laboratory and his work and I am also interested to hear from him the volatile, role of volatile in mantle rock, of course in another day. But today I request Shujai to please come and deliver today's talk. Sujay, please. Hello. 
Hello. Yes. Hello. Yes, Can you hear me? You are audible, sir. Yes. Yeah, you are audible. Okay. So, uh, can you see my my slides? Uh, no, so you have to present it once more, I guess. I see. I see. Just. Can you see now? Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, okay. Sir. Uh, may I start? Yeah. Yes, sir. Sure, sir. Okay. Uh, thank you for such a nice introduction, and I also would like to thank the organizer for inviting me in this uh, seminar, and a special thanks to all the students who are involved in organizing such a wonderful uh, this. Uh, online uh, seminar so uh, the talk uh, the title of my talk is application of high pressure research in earth sciences and uh, i will mostly try to cover what are the the experiments what are the what are the apparatus used in the high pressure research in earth sciences and some idea about its application so uh, if you see the 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 branch of of, of uh, earth sciences that is experimental petrology. So this field is basically uh, high pressure and high temperature experiments, and uh, which concerned with the experimentally determine the physical and chemical behavior of rock and their constituents. So if you see the first melting experiment in natural rocks or mineral that was uh, performed at high pressure and temperature condition, were actually carried out by Sir James Hall in 18th century. So during that time, some of the, the geologists, they were concerned about the magnetic origin of the salt. So he was a Scottish geologist and physicist. So what he did, he actually used a high temperature furnace. And in 18th century, already the high temperature furnace was widely used in the ceramic industry and in the uh, glass industry and he slightly modified the high pressure this furnace and uh, from that he can actually melt the the natural rocks mostly uh, limestone and basalt and he can produce basically um, um, uh, exactly the similar composition of natural basalt with its texture so a couple of hundred years before we can say that experimental petrology was started. And uh, what he did, he actually used a gun barrel. And in that gun barrel, he you can see in the left-hand side diagram, there is a, some cold seal pressure vessel. And in this, uh, he basically took a, a gun barrel. And in the gun barrel, he put his sample. And in that sample, he mixed little amount of water to just keep the temperature uh, to reduce the melting temperature of the rock and he sealed the gun barrel and he put this gun barrel in the high temperature and while doing this he can generate a pressure up to a 0.1 gigapascal remember 0.1 gigapascal is equivalent to 1 kilowatt and he can produce a temperature in his experiment up to 600 degrees celsius and this experiment high temperature and high pressure experiment uh, was very useful for the metamorphic reaction and what he did he actually first time melted the limestone at high pressure converted into a marble so you can say that the first uh, metamorphic reaction experiment high pressure experiment was for by Sir James Hall. He also modified this high temperature furnace and he precisely determined the force of the, of the piston which is used in this high temperature furnace. You can see there is a, he called that, that uh, pressure gauge as a dead weight pressure gauge. So what he did, he 
put a uh, some balancing weight at the end of the of the of the rod and he can precisely measure the pressure of this this uh, he precisely measure the force of this pressure gauge and from that he can calculate the pressure so almost uh, uh, his era uh, this way we we uh, do uh, he was doing he was performing a high high pressure experiment and if you see today we are for exactly the same method uh, of course there are some advancement in the technology but uh, basic principle is more or less the same and then uh, then in in first half of the 20th century uh, the first half of the of the of the 20th century uh, uh, this uh, uh, professor from from harvard university percy bridgman he has a immense contribution in high pressure research so he was most working on the phase transition in in uh, different uh, phosphate and some other phases and he wanted to see that if this phase is changing to the metallic phase or not which has a wide application in in in, in material science uh, stream and uh, he can generate a pressure up to a moderate pressure of to 10 gigapascal during uh, his time and uh, for his contribution in 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 high pressure research uh, he received a nobel prize in physics in 1946 for his his work in high pressure research and recently uh, there are uh, some meteorites in which uh, earth's uh, largest or or the most uh, volumetric phase is present uh, perovskite that is uh, uh, naturally occurred in tenha meteorite in australia and uh, IMA International Mineralogical Association gave this magnesium perovskite to his name to honor his contribution in high pressure research and now we call the magnesium perovskite as a bridgmanite and you can see the crystal structure of the bridgmanite at the center panel at the same time uh, in geophysical lab in in uh, carnegie institute in united states another uh, uh, american uh, canadian uh, he uh, did uh, some uh, uh, one atmospheric pressure experiment at high temperature his name was professor norman l bowen and he did lots of experiment at at the basaltic composition and also in the granitic composition in a hydro system and uh, based on his his one atmospheric high temperature experiment uh he uh, uh suggested that uh, if you melt a hydrosilicate you can produce a granite and uh, this is his first paper very famous phase diagram that is a solute in solute solution between anorthite and albite and that was published in 1912 and this binary phase diagram has a wide application in 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 uh, modern um, igneous petrology and his other works has also a wide application in the modern uh, igneous petrology so these two uh, uh, scientists uh, have have immense contribution in the experimental petrology and uh, i will little bit explain about the the inner structure of the earth so uh, to just know what kind of composition is present in the inside the earth and uh, if you see the the inner structure of the earth so earth is a layered structure and and broadly it is divided into a uh, three parts so the upper part is thinner one that is a crust and uh, you, we have a continental crust we have a, a oceanic crust and uh, uh, depend on uh, composition uh, or location uh, depth, depth varies and uh, that is a uh, just a very uh, little volume percent compared to the total uh, volume of the earth is less than 6% and if you see the the just below the crust we have a mantle and 70% of 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 the earth is is mantle and i will go in detail in the next slide and then we have a outer core which is in the liquid phase and then we have a inner core that is a solid phase and uh, now the question comes if the radius of the earth is is 6370 km so 
Now, the question is how far down man can, can go to this earth. So, uh, if you see the, the left hand top panel, this uh, figure, so there is a is a deepest mine is in the Johannesburg, South Africa, that is a Tautona gold mine. And, and Tautona gold mine is very famous because this is the deepest mine and also uh, in this mine, uh, geologists extract the gold and uh, geologists can drill up to, uh, dug a hole up to uh, four kilometer, three precisely, three 3.9 kilometer and below that it is not possible to dig because at that particular depth the temperature of the earth is almost 60 degrees celsius and pressure is is several hundred times more than the atmospheric pressure to keep the mine habitable you need a uh, it's difficult to, to uh, keep uh, habitable uh, conditions in that depth so the deepest mine is up to a four kilometer. So you can, if you convert to the to the volume per se, so it's just very, very tiny compared to the total radius of the earth. And uh, so if you cannot go below four kilometer, the next question comes, how deep we can dig a hole? So there is a, is a several uh, drilling program, continental crust drilling program. And there is a very famous drilling program in Russia that is in, in Kula Pro Peninsula, and uh, in this peninsula, Russian scientists can drill up to a 12.3 kilometer depth, and we can collect a sample up to a 12.3 kilometer depth. And if you compare with a, with a radius of, of the Earth, that is 6,370 kilometer, it's a very small part. So if you see the another uh, information, which is coming from the interior of the earth is from the mantle xenolith. And uh, mantle xenolith is, a, is a some foreign uh, particle uh, for foreign rock, which is uh, uh, getting inside the some kimberlite volcanism. And uh, these, uh, these are uh, shown in the, in the right hand uh, top panel. And uh, in this uh, mantle xenolith, this is basically a peridotite xenolith. And in this peridotite xenolith, you have mostly a uh, olven, then you have a two types of pyroxene. So olivine is a, is a light green and dark green is a pyroxene. And then big red, these crystals are actually garnet. And these xenoliths are coming from five, uh, 150 to 200 kilometer. And sometimes if we are lucky, we get a sample just below 200 kilometer depth. And that is in the form of diamond. So sometimes these diamonds are trapping some fine inclusions and if you study these fine inclusions and if you know the the mineralogy of the of the deep mantle or earth's interior you can tell that at which depth these diamonds are coming so if we cannot go deep um, if we cannot go deep below um, 700 kilometer that is still uh, just few hundred kilometer compared to uh, radius of the earth. So how do we determine the structure and composition of the earth? So most of the earth is inaccessible. So uh, major information about interior of the earth is coming from geophysical method, that is a seismology. So in the seismology, mostly uh, geophysicists, they study the seismic waves and that propagate uh, uh, through the different layers of the earth and then it reflect and, and refract and then finally they collect all this uh, uh, P wave and S waves and uh, from that they are trying to understand what kind of, of material is present inside the earth and from, from this information they can actually measure the physical property of that material and they they uh, use uh, some 2D, uh, some ultrasonic image uh, information. So uh, that is used in the medical profession. So for example, if you see, this is a tomographic structure of the mantle at different location. And uh, blue is basically a high velocity, which indicates, so, so you can see there are different colors. For example, if you see the Central America, 
And in the Central America, you see that some of the material, that blue color, is going to the core mental boundary. So there are a three dash line you can see in this diagram. So upper one is a 410 kilometer depth, and the middle one is 660 kilometer depth. And uh, the center America, uh, the lower one is the core mental boundary that is at 2,900 kilometer depth. So if you see this, this tomographic structure, you will understand that how the material is uh, moving in, inside the earth once it's subducted. So in the, in the central Japan, the Pacific plate is going just below the Japan and it is not moving below the 660 kilometer depth that is indicated by a, this middle dash line. But if you see the Central America, the subducting slab is moving to the core mental boundary. So if you see this image from that, two things you can interpret. First thing is that, that the material is moving to the, to the lower mantle and there is a, is a single convection in terms of uh, seismological point of view. And uh, if the slab is not going to the penetrating to the lower mantle, then there is a two layer convection. So uh, there is a, always a debate that earth has a single layer or there is a double layer. So if slab is moving to the, to the lower mantle, then there is a single uh, layer convection. And if slab is moving to the, to the upper mantle, then there is a two layer convection. And this blue colors are basically a high velocity region. So this indicates the temperature would be much lower than the surrounding mantle. And red color area indicates the uh, low velocity and this will be a hot regions. So from this kind of 2D imaging, if you collect with, uh, with different depth, you can actually make a three dimensional view of the earth. And from this three dimensional view, uh, you will find a different uh, this uh, colors. So the bottom line is is your core mental boundary, and this is at the at the surface. So you see some blue material is moving upward, and even some location you're just below uh, uh, Africa. Some material is is hot material is moving from the from the core mental boundary. So this kind of information is very, very helpful because from this kind of information, uh, seismologists basically interpret what kind of composition, what kind of temperature Earth has at different layers. So there is a, is a also very informative, uh, there is also a very important uh, information which comes from seismology that is a, uh, your P wave and S wave, how it's changing, and also how the density is changing with depth. So if you see the this VP, that is a primary wave, and there is a VS, that is a secondary wave, denoted by a dash line. So you see the, the primary VP wave is basically increasing when you're moving from upper mantle to transition node to lower mantle. And then there is a is a is a sharp drop in the velocity and then again it's increasing and then again it's increasing in the inner core because at uh, 2900 kilometer depth the composition is changing and outer core is completely liquid so a vp is not showing any value at the outer core uh, uh, depth condition and again is appearing when you go to the inner core so seismologists can can calculate the density of the of the material at different depth and which is very helpful for calculating the pressure so if you see in the vp there are several kinks at the upper mantle and and the in the uh, transition or even in the lower mantle and most people believe that these kinks are responsible for a phase transition but because we do not have any means in mid 50s we didn't have any sample from the transition zone. So most of the, the seismological data are, are rely from the 
your uh, experimental petrology experiments. So I will also slightly uh, explain about the PT condition inside the earth. So if you see the, the, the bold, this uh, black line, that is a variation of pressure inside the earth. So it's a kind of a, uh, uh, with, with uh, depth, pressure is increasing and it's a straight forward. You, if you know the density of the material at different depth, you can calculate the pressure. And uh, there is a temperature, you can see the gray region. And in the gray region, you can, you cannot, uh, uh, it, it's, it's a region because it's difficult to calculate a temperature. And what mostly uh, experimentalists, they do, they try to rely on the experiment because the inner and outer core boundary uh, if you perform an experiment that is a liquid state is changing to the solid state and if you if you perform an experiment at that condition and if you can make a, uh, your uh, iron uh, starting material or metal to a solid state you can convert that one so that will give you a idea about the temperature of the inner core uh, inner and outer core boundary so but performing this kind of experiment creates loss of temperature gradient and because of that, you can see the, there is an is a envelope, and these envelopes covers a wide range of pressure temperature. But uh, roughly, you can say that the Earth's core, or when you move from the surface to the core, temperature is increasing. And uh, the center of the Earth has a temperature close to 7,000 Kelvin or 6,000 Kelvin, and uh, it's relatively hot. So uh, this kind of information we get from the from the experiment, and uh, we our interest as an experimental petrologist that how these different materials behave at different PT conditions. So what we we mostly do we uh, perform an experiment in the lab, and to perform experiment we need a starting material. A starting material is our our rock composition. So we can use a natural uh, uh, rock composition or we can use a synthetic oxide composition. The natural rock composition has uh, some advantages as well as some drawbacks because uh, in natural rock composition, equilibrium will be, will be fast because that rock composition is in, in equilibrium for millions of years. So you don't need a to keep your experiment for, for longer duration. But in natural samples, sometimes some inclusion, some impurities are present, which actually increases the number of component in your system. And we don't want to, to increase the number of component during our experiment. So because of that, many experimentalists, they try to use a synthetic oxide. So we know the composition of the rock in the basis of different oxides. So we buy these oxides from the from the Alpha Azar or some other company, and uh, we try to mix it in an agate. We homogenize this this different oxide, SiO2, MgO, calcium oxide, aluminum oxide, sodium oxide. All, all these oxide we mix it in an agate and mix homogeneous mixture, and then we put this starting material in a high pressure apparatus. So this is a high pressure apparatus. This this is called uh, piston cylinder apparatus and using this apparatus you can you can easily go up to a 100 kilometer depth and you can understand uh, what kind of uh, processes are going on in the shallow upper mantle condition and after the experiment we uh, take out our run charge and we prepare a experimental mount uh, we prepare a mount from the experimental charge so you see uh, there are um, mount in which you have a six experimental charge so the outer part is is a mount some kind of epoxy and uh, you have a six this uh, rectangular shape uh, metal capsule most probably these are platinum and uh, center part is your uh, black part is your run product so that is our experiment at any high pressure and high temperature condition and we are interested to know the textural relation of this particular sample at particular pressure and temperature condition. 
So if you zoom this uh, experimental charge using uh, some high-end equipment, for example, electron probe microanalyzer, you can easily uh, see what is present in this run product. And uh, this is given in the backscattered image. So if you see this backscattered image, uh, there is a bar that indicates a 30 micrometer um, length. So you can see that these are very tiny samples. And uh, in this experiment, the pressure was 10 gigapascal. So 10 gigapascal is equivalent to uh, 300 kilometer depth and relatively very high temperature, 1700 degrees C, and duration was six hours. So in this partial melt experiment, garnet, some euhedral rounded garnets were present, and that garnet was very close to the to the uh, melt region. So most probably in this experiment, garnet is a liquidous phase. And then you have some gray olivin, which is indicated by OL. And then you have a, some kind of clino -instatite. So this kind of information is very useful to construct a phase diagram at high pressure and high temperature condition. Another information about the composition of the earth and its structure is come from the xenoliths and from the volcanoes. And uh, most of the volcanoes are coming from the shallow depth but if you see the some of the uh, deepest uh, this uh, peridotites so there are some peridotites from from dharwar craton so these are coming from the base of the dharwar craton so it's almost like a 180 kilometer depth and uh, we have sometimes a peridotitic composition uh, and sometimes we have a eclogitic composition which also suggests that mantle is not homogeneous, it's a heterogeneous. You have a different composition. And these xenoliths are mostly uh, brought to the surface by, by kimberlite. And there is a, is a famous South African uh, kimberlite. Uh, uh, this is an open pit. And you can, you can see uh, this is, a, I think, more than a kilometer area diameter. And uh, in this uh, kimberlite, uh, these are very explosive kind of volcanism. And uh, at present, there is a no active kimberlite volcanism. The last one was, uh, I think, 10 or 15 or 20 exactly. I don't remember, but 20 million years before in, in Africa. And uh, these kimberlites are is in a carrot shape. And they have very explosive and they have lots of volatile in their composition. So they bring uh, some material from the Earth's interior and from this kind of xenoliths and from the diamond which is trapped in this kimberlite gives you some idea about the mineralogy of the deep mantle and Earth's interior. Another kind of information which comes from the natural sample is from the meteorite. And uh, meteorites, uh, there are different types of meteorite and if you can can analyze this meteorite, this will also give you some idea about the composition of the, of the earth. So I will I will spend some time for the composition of, of the mantle. And in this diagram, you will see the y-axis is a depth, and depth is increasing when you go from top to bottom. So at, at top, you are at the surface, and at the bottom, you are in the lower mantle. So, and x-axis is your volume fraction of different uh, uh, minerals and this mental composition is mostly for a peridotitic composition or pyrolytic composition so if you see the upper mantle in the upper mantle you mostly 60 volume percent of olivine is present so you have a olivine which is almost a 60 volume percent is present and then almost a little bit more than a uh, 10% is is garnet, and then remaining is your 2-pyroxene, that is orthopyroxene and clinopyroxene. And here you have a olivine that is in a orthorhombic structure. And when you go a little bit down, and when you cross the upper mantle, and when you go to the transition zone, your olivine is changes to a this structure, and uh, the uh, there is a polymorph of olivine that is called as a wasleyite, and uh, this 
orthorhombic structure will change to modified spindle structure. And at that particular depth uh, in the transition zone, 410 kilometer to 520 kilometer, the wasleyite is stable and 60 volume percent, roughly 60 percent volume percent of wasleyite is stable at the upper part of the transition zone. And the remaining one is your uh, garnet, but it's not a pure garnet because this uh, pyroxene will react with the garnet at shallow level and it will go inside the garnet structure and it will change to So silica proportion will in your uh, transition zone depth. And below this 520 kilometer depth, Olvin has another uh, phase transition that is called as a ring light. Hello. Uh, so ringodite, and that is a, your spinel structure. And when you go much deeper in the lower mantle, most of the lower mantle, 80% of the lower mantle is made up of, of magnesium perovskite. And now this magnesium perovskite is called as a bridgmanite. And then in the lower mantle, you have a ferropericlase, and then you have a, some amount of calcium perovskite. And these phases, for example, uh, this ringodite is, is recently been reported in, in inclusions of some super deep diamond from Juina, Brazil. And uh, uh, these diamonds, uh, uh, so there is a paper by P.S. Little in 19, uh, uh, 2014. And in this uh, study, what he did, he, he studied the inclusions in diamond and he observed that these diamonds inclusions not only contains a high pressure form of olivine, but also these high pressure polymorph of olivine contains a very large amount of water, up to a one weight percent of water. So you can imagine that if your mantle transition zone, 60% transition zone is made up of your ringodite, then uh, if this ringodite can contain a one weight percent of water, so most of the water can be accommodated in the transition zone. So there is a is a uh, other information about the about the density of the of the core. So we know that uh, earth outer core is a liquid and inner core is a solid. And uh, if you see the the pressure versus density diagram, so in the x axis you have a density, and in the y axis you have a pressure. So there is a CMB that is a core mental boundary, which is at, at 135 gigapascal. And then you have a ICB that is an inner core boundary that is almost a 330 kilometer depth. So if how the density is changing with a depth, and uh, this is from the, from the seismic observation, from the seismology. And when you try to compare this seismic data with uh, your pure iron. So if you perform an experiment at uh, high pressure and high temperature condition, and uh, you want to see that what would be the density of the iron at, at inner core or, or outer core condition, so you will find that. So there is a, is a, there is a rectangle, uh, this uh, red dash line. So uh, in this uh, dash line, this shows a pure iron density at uh, high pressure and high temperature condition using a diamond anvil cell experiment. And this density is much higher than the real uh, your uh, density of the, of the inner core or outer core. So from this kind of information, you can understand that the density of the earth is lower than the density of the pure iron. And this density and, and in, in, in experimental petrology or in the mineral physics, this is called as a density deficit. So earth has a 10% density deficit when you co uh, compare with a pure iron. So uh, what, what does it mean? Suppose if you have uh, some, uh, if you do not have a pure iron, then what are the material present in the, in the, in the core? So 
general physicist and uh, many other uh, uh, high pressure high temperature experimentalists they suggested that that earth has a some light element and this light element density is is lower than the iron so if you mix a certain proportion of light element with a uh, iron so you can reduce the density of the of the core so uh, there are some light element is present in the in the core and there are some criteria for that to selecting this different light element so it must be a high cosmic abundance and so basically any uh, element which has a lower atomic number than iron could be a light element if it just covers all these three criteria so if a uh, element has a high cosmic abundance if it sufficiently soluble in iron nickel alloy because if it will not soluble in iron nickel alloy it will not stay for a longer duration and uh, partition strongly into the liquid iron during low pressure melting because the core formation was not at a 300 or 400 uh, gigapascal pressure it is a relatively lower pressure at 30 to 50 gigapascal pressure and based on this this suggestion people have suggested that oxygen silicon sulfur carbon hydrogen potassium this could be a uh, light element so now how we calculate the pressure so that is the next question so it's a very simple as i i have shown in my introductory slide that uh, sir james uh, uh, Hall he actually calculated the pressure by just putting a weight at the at the rod at the end and uh, so pressure is is calculated by force upon area so you can increase the pressure by just simply uh, increasing a force or decreasing a area so just few examples if you see the the pressure at sea level so the pressure is one atmosphere and if you go to the Uh, top of the mount everest so the pressure is reduced because air columns are are relatively light so you have a lower uh, uh, pressure one fourth of the atmospheric pressure and when you go to the deeper part of the of the earth or or when you go for the scuba dive so uh, for example the deepest scuba dive is almost like 300 meter depth and and that depth your pressure is 32 atmosphere and at the center of the of the earth your pressure is 3 364 gigapascal that is a 3.5 million atmospheric pressure so you can understand that the earth interior has a very huge pressure very high pressure so now the question is if you have a relatively very heavy thing so can you increase a, a pressure or if you have a lighter thing but a smaller thing uh, you will have a heavy pressure so you can understand from from this diagram so suppose if you have if you see a elephant if you take a elephant the weight of the elephant is is uh, take 4500 km 4500 kg and suppose if his feet is almost a 260 cm square area and if that foot is uh, put on your your feet so you will find the pressure of 10 atmospheric pressure that is we generally if we do a scuba diving we uh, is a much uh, larger pressure than the 10 atmospheric pressure so basically if you have a very large body but if the area is big it will not create a very high pressure but if you see the the women who is wearing a heel and suppose uh, the women uh, whose weight is 45 km uh, kilogram and the area of the tip of the heel is 0.5 cm square so that will create a 100 atmospheric pressure so a uh, women in high heel uh, can produce a 10 times larger pressure than the elephant who is uh, uh, much heavier than the Yes. so pressure is not only dependent on force but area also plays a very vital role so there are uh, three different types of uh, equipment we are using there are some other type of equipment but i will try to just stick to the three this different equipment so the first one is a piston cylinder apparatus and in this piston cylinder apparatus 
um, we can easily go up to a four gigapascal pressure. In few labs, uh, people can go up to a six gigapascal or a little bit higher also. But generally, uh, we can easily go up to the four gigapascal pressure. And there is, a, is a another uh, uh, type of apparatus that is called as a multi-anvil apparatus. And in this multi-anvil apparatus, you can easily go up to a 25 gigapascal pressure and uh, which is equivalent to 660 kilometer depth. And uh, you can easily study uh, the materials property or phase relation or any other other, other thing in multi-anvil press. And there is a, another uh, apparatus which is called a diamond anvil cell. And using a diamond anvil cell, we can easily go up to a 400 gigapascal pressure or equivalent to the center of the earth. So the center of the earth is 364 gigapascal. So these three apparatus play a very vital role for uh, generating a high pressure, high temperature condition uh, in different materials. And from that, we can uh, further uh, get some idea about uh, materials properties in the earth's interior. So this is a, just a summary. So if you take a piston cylinder, multi-anvil and diamond anvil, so these different depths, uh, you can cover a range. So piston cylinder, you can easily cover the uh, lithospheric mantle condition. And in the multi-anvil, you can go up to cover the transition zone depth. And diamond anvil, of course, you can go up to a core, uh, inner core or outer core condition. So this is a, a piston cylinder apparatus. We recently, uh, uh, not recently, uh, two and a half year back, we purchased this one and uh, we calibrated this press. And uh, in this uh, apparatus, we uh, can perform an experiment at uh, shallow pressure depth and uh, high temperature. And uh, so basically, this is a cross section of the piston cylinder. So in the left hand side, you will see at the bottom, there is a piston and that piston is, uh, is inserting inside the bomb. There is a, some, uh, there is a, some hollow uh, cylindrical part in which the, this mushroom shape, this tungsten carbide and hard steel piston will go inside. And, uh, it will generate a sample pressure inside the your cell assembly, and uh, we use uh, different types of of cell assembly. We have a talc uh, at the outer uh, sleeve, and then after that we have a uh, some kind of um, pyrex glass, and then uh, we have uh, some resistive uh, heater to just uh, heat the sample and uh, to measure this resistance. We have a thermocouple and at the center uh, we have a our sample which is in a platinum capsule or gold capsule depending on your purpose and uh, we can easily go up to a 3.5 gigapascal in our lab and temperature up to a 1000 degrees celsius and during the experiment what we do we also connect this press with a, or bomb or and the supporting anvils or plates with a uh, cold water so that the body of the of the apparatus will be at room temperature during a experiment because sometimes we run experiment for several days to weeks and if you run an experiment for uh, 1000 degree or, or or 800 degree for one week you can understand that the heat will diffuse and if you will not cool the the system uh, it will be completely hot and you, your experiment can be failed. So to run this kind of experiment, you uh, need uh, many supporting um, uh, apparatus. For first and foremost is you need uh, high temperature furnaces because that is uh, uh, crucial to uh, synthesize uh, or prepare your, your starting material. So we have uh, some uh, high temperature furnace also in the IIT Kharagpur in the material science, science or chemical engineering department we have a 1600 degree furnace and in this furnace you can easily synthesize a diopside and some other silicates and that can be used for your starting material or for a calibration 
and then we have a some tenton press which mostly used to extract the sample after the experiment so we this time go to the to the uh, uh, some other department to extract the sample and then we have some uh, mounting press analytical balance which is used to uh, weigh your uh, starting material oxide and some lathe machine which is very very uh, important for preparation of the your cell assembly and everything we do it here and uh, um, to run this kind of experiment uh, uh, we have a, a, a team of students and uh, currently there are many students are working on the experimental uh, uh, this uh, field and uh, uh, jitain is, is working on a um, jitain patnaik is a, is a final year phd student he is mostly working on a uh, mental zen and uh, kishan is mostly working on the high temperature phases in meteorites and jitain shomendu and uh, they are working on an experimental project and we have uh, another phd student rajesh who is working in meteorite so uh, we have also some mtech and msc student and uh, uh, so they will uh, submit their, their uh, dissertation i think next year so uh, let's move to the multi anvil apparatus in the multi anvil apparatus we have uh, uh, two uh, blocks top portion and the bottom portion and the in the top hello hello uh, yes sir you are on call now uh, okay so uh, in the in the multi anvil press uh basically in the piston cylinder you have a bomb and that bomb has a uh, this center part is hollow cavity and in that uh, hollow part cylindrical part you put your pressure uh, assembly but in case of multi anvil we use a different anvils so you can see there are eight anvils in the right hand side diagram and these anvils are basically truncated at the edge so the way it's truncated that this mgo pressure media octahedron can be placed here and then we put uh, another top four anvils at the top of the at the uh, the bottom of this four anvil and all this eight cubes will go inside the the multi anvil and in this multi anvil the tungsten these anvils are basically made up of tungsten carbide and uh, this is called as a second stage anvil and then you have a uh, three top and three bottom uh, hardened steel uh, anvils so which actually compress your sample and uh, in case of piston cylinder we are using a uniaxial pressure but here you apply a pressure from top and bottom but because your anvils are truncated from the from the four sides from the uh, bottom four anvils and uh, from the for top anvil so pressure is applied from all the sides so it's a little bit different from the piston cylinder apparatus the experiment and uh, you can see the the image of the of the cell assembly so we have a uh, this seven anvils eight one is just removed to show the how uh, the experiment looks and these are uh, the center part is uh, the hole and in this hole the cell assembly will go your capsule material that is a any metal capsule or any other material can go and uh, we uh, put this assembly in the in the multi anvil and here you will find the the cross section of the cell assembly and uh, we put a thermocouple to just measure the temperature uh, in the in the experiment and uh, we put a thermocouple very close to the sample and uh, in multi anvil mostly we use a lanthanum chromite heater because uh, in piston cylinder we use a graphite furnace which is changes to a uh, diamond at more than 5 gpa pressure so it's very difficult to extract the sample if you if you use a graphite furnace so because of that uh, most high pressure experimentalists they use uh, in multi anvil 
the lanthanum chromite heater. So there is another very interesting uh, uh, multi-anvil press that is called as a uh, rocking uh, multi-anvil press. And in this rocking multi-anvil press, you can see your whole this uh, uh, press, whole apparatus is actually uh, rotating 180 degrees. So, and the pressure is almost like a transition ion pressure, so huge pressure. So you have a 20 gigapascal pressure you have a 15 gigapascal pressure. So you can understand that uh, in this kind of uh, uh, high pressure, uh, people are also uh, rotating this uh, multi-anvil. And the advantage of this rocking multi-anvil press is that when you perform an experiment, in the experiment, you always have a temperature gradient. And when you have a temperature gradient, so you always get a uh, gradient in the in the composition. So to overcome from this problem, uh, people uh, try to uh, uh, modify this multi-anvil press and they, they prepare a rocking multi-anvil press. So in that, if you rotate the press during the experiment, your uh, low density material will move upward and then it will go downward. So everything will be homogeneous. So you will not get a, a, a stratification in your uh, run product. So this kind of uh, Press is, is uh, present in ETH and some other labs also have this kind of unique facility. Um, so this is a very, very uh, important uh, multi-anvil press for, for knowing the composition of the transition zone and, and uh, upper mantle. So I will uh, slightly move to the, to the now application part, and uh, I will try to, to cover a few topics quickly. Uh, and uh, I, for last 15, 16 years, I'm working on a, on a, a deep carbon cycle. So I will a little bit give you some brief idea about the, the carbon, how it behaves in the deep mantle. So if you see the, the left-hand uh, side figure, so in this figure, your slab is subducting, and the slab is made up of, of uh, beta pilides and, uh, and uh, some carbonates and oceanic crust. All these uh, uh, layers can contain uh, uh, some amount of carbonate. So carbonate can subduct to the deeper part of the earth. And when these materials are, are uh, subducted to the deeper part of the earth, how it behaves. So if you see the different forms of, of uh, carbon, so in the in the shallow depth, uh, not only the speciation of carbon is is depend on the only pressure, but it also depend on the oxygen fugacity. So if you see the the graphite, which is stable at up to a five little bit more than five gigapascal pressure, but in a reduced condition compared to uh, FMQ buffer. So your graphite is only stable if a condition of the mantle is very reduced. But if you make a system very oxidized, this graphite will immediately change to CO fluid or some carbonatitic fluids and some fluids, which is more stable in the oxidizing condition. When you go to the deeper part, so graphite will convert to diamond and uh, at a low oxygen fugacity, and if you make a system oxidized, it will diamond will convert to this oxidized form of carbon that is a carbonate. So uh, in the shallow part, you mostly have a melt and vapor and uh, and carbonates. But when you go to the deeper part, either you have a diamond or carbide. So carbide is also a stable form of of carbon. And uh, for example, steel is a carbide. So uh, in the lower mantle, the people have suggested that diamond or carbide or pure iron could be a stable form of, of carbon. And when you go to the to the core, either it's present in the form of metal or iron carbide or melt. So if you see the total uh, carbon uh, concentration or, or total carbon which is present in the deep carbon, so 90% of the carbon is present in the core 
and only 10% of carbon is a, is a present in the mantle but but there are some controversies we will think that uh, more carbon is present in the mantle but but earth interior has a more carbon than the biosphere and at the surface and what kind of uh, uh, problem you can solve using a, this high pressure experiment so suppose if you are interested in uh, knowing the, the partial melting experiment and you're interested to know the solidus of particular system, here is a solidus of carbonated fertile peridotite. So what we do, we perform an experiment at lower uh, temperature conditions and we try to see what kind of uh, experimental results we are getting. For example, uh, if you see the backscattered image in the uh, right hand side panel, so you see only a garnet, ringwoodite, and magnesite is present, and there is a no melt is present. And when you increase the temperature at high pressure, at the same pressure, isobaric condition, some of the melts are, are generating and magnesite is disappearing. So basically, if you know the temperature of these two runs, so you can constrain at particular pressure, you can constrain the solidus. So solidus, so open, uh, upper triangle will be uh, your subsolidus run and the dark black downward triangle is your uh, super solidus run so you can you can see that your solidus will be in between these two experiments and you can precisely constrain the solidus of any system and you can draw a, a solidus and you can also analyze this tiny melt and you can see that what kind of melt is stable in this system at particular uh, pressure and temperature condition and it shows exactly the same composition as a natural magma or not. So this is a one, one type of experiment you can do and uh, uh, I think there is a, another some interesting um, studies about uh, inclusions of, of diamonds, super deep diamonds. So there is a very famous location in Juina and in this Juina province you can uh, find some uh, super deep diamonds. And if you study these super deep diamonds, uh, people have studied these super deep diamonds. And in this, these diamonds are very famous for some of the lower mantle phases. So um, this is a very famous paper from uh, Walter Eater. And uh, in this uh, Juina province, they studied the, the inclusions in diamond and uh, they uh, observe that um, these uh, inclusions are very similar to the lower mental phases. For example, if you see the figure E, so some tap phase is present. And if you see figure F, some calcium perovskite is stable. And uh, so, so these tap phase is mostly, if you know the, the phase diagram of basalt at, at lower mantle or in the transition zone, you can correlate your this natural uh, uh, diamond inclusion uh, result to the to the uh, phase diagram of uh, or uh, 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 model proportion of basalt or peridotite in the in the lower mantle. So uh, what they did, they they tried to uh, compare uh, these uh, inclusions with a uh, uh, basalt experiment and with a, with a peridotite experiment and they observed that the composition which they are finding in these inclusions are very close to the basaltic composition and uh, they also uh, try to measure the uh, carbon isotope composition of uh, these diamonds and out of six four diamonds are showing uh, organic carbon and uh, which is a very uh, uh, light a, in um, uh, delta 13 carbon is close to 15 to 20, minus 15 to 20. And these uh, values are suggesting that these uh, diamonds are formed from the recycling of oceanic uh, uh, organic source carbon. So based on this uh, uh, result, they suggested that a slab can subduct to the, to the, to the lower mantle and uh, uh, these carbons are showing us some organic material. And based on that, they, they try to make a model and they already have a mineral proportion basalt. So if you remember 
in the in the previous slide, I have shown you the mineral proportion in peridotite, where 60% of the upper mantle is made up of olivine. But here the scenario is different because this is a massive composition, and you have mostly uh, in the upper mantle you have a CPX carnate and stishovite. Stishovite is a high pressure polymorph of of quartz, and when you go lower and lower, uh, this basaltic composition is changing to only a uh, garnet and stishovite. And in lower mantle, you have a stishovite, calcium perovskite, magnesium perovskite, then some sodium rich phases. And based on that, they have made uh, some kind of story and they suggested that these materials are, are subducted to the lower mantle. And then finally, this material is brought to the surface by the mantle plume beneath a Juina province in Brazil. So there is the last, this uh, uh, apparatus that is called as a diamond anvil cell. And uh, the diamond anvil cell, uh, we use a gem quality a diamond and uh, the tip is, is uh, cut and we make the tip flat. And uh, we put our sample in between these two tip. And you can, you if you remember the, the previous slide, I said that if you have a very tiny area, you can generate a very high pressure. So basically, we, they just try to apply a force at the top and from the bottom using a screw. And they put some gasket in between the two diamond tips. And they put their sample here. And using a laser heating, they can analyze the temperature also. And diamonds are, are transparent. So during the experiment, they collect the X-ray data. And they can understand what is going on in the high pressure and high temperature condition. And this diamond anvil cell, you can easily go up to the core pressure or lower mantle pressure or, or center of the earth or even some other uh, planets where pressure is, is much higher than the earth. So another uh, uh, very uh, important discovery in the earth science in, in mineral physics and experimental petrology is, is a is a perovskite to post perovskite transition. Now perovskite is called as a bridge minite. And uh, so this is actually perovskite will change to post perovskite structure and this structure perovskite will change to a layered structure. And this transition is exactly taking place at very uh, close to the D double prime layer. So lots of research are, are concentrating on the physical properties or properties of post perovskite and how the post perovskite behaves in the deep uh, the lower mantle. So this is also a very important uh, application in the uh, mineral physics and experimental petrology. And another one very fundamental phase diagram in, in uh, earth sciences is the phase diagram of iron. And for a long time, people have debated that earth inner core is a HCP structure or BCC structure. So iron has a metal has a different structure. So uh, if you know the phase diagram of iron, you can easily uh, uh, tell what kind of uh, what kind of uh, structure iron has in the inner core. So this is uh, your uh, pressure temperature diagram of iron. And uh, iron has a several phase transition. At a very low pressure, it's a body-centered cubic. And then at shallow pressure and high temperature, it has a phase-centered cubic. And again, at very high temperature and shallow pressure, you have a uh, body-centered cubic. But when you go to the higher pressure, you mostly have a HCP structure. So, and these HCP structure of iron is a, is a you you cannot quench this phase. So so basically, when you release the pressure, it get back to the BCC structure, body center cubic. And because of that, there was a confusion for for long time that Earth has a BCC structure or a HCP structure. And if you see the the geotherm, which is close to uh, five thousand Kelvin or six thousand Kelvin at uh, 350 or 360 gigapascal pressure. So Earth has a mostly a HCP structure. So I will stop here and uh, I will uh, like to hear some questions.
I would like to thank Dr. Ghosh for this wonderful session. Thank you, sir, for sharing such enriching knowledge with us. Uh, we have received uh, several questions from our audience, uh, which are in the process of being revised. Once done, uh, Dr. Ghosh will surely like to address them. In the meanwhile, I would like to remind everyone Tomorrow, we shall have with us Dr. Masako Yoshikawa, researcher at the Department of Earth and Planetary System Science, graduate school of advanced science and engineering, Hiroshima University, Japan, who will be delivering her lecture at 11 a.m. on the topic, Deciphering Petrological Processes Using Geochemistry of Pyrotite, a case study of the Oman Opioids. Uh, we are really overwhelmed by all your response to our endeavors so far and would be even more happy by your presence in our lecture session tomorrow. Please uh, just wait a few more moments and then we will start with our question and answer session. Okay, so the first question is from Debarun Mukherjee, uh, UG3, Presidency University. Why is there variability in seismic diagrams in Central America and Japan? How does it explain behavior of magma mixing, mantle wedge assimilation, and supra subduction zone volcanism at the back R? Sir? Uh, I, uh, I think that uh, sorry is having some network issue. Okay, okay, okay. I apologize to all. Uh, I think there's a technical issue. Uh, we are trying to resolve it as soon as possible. Please uh, patiently wait with us for a few moments before we solve it. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, am I audible? Yes, yes, they were only audible. Uh, we are facing some technical issues while they are being solved. Um, I would like to remind everybody that tomorrow we shall be having with us Dr. Masako Yoshikawa, who no, works in the field of geochemistry and igneous petrology, has set a significant and everlasting mm -hmm. footprint in the field. She's a well-known petrologist. She has worked on the Andaman and Oman Ophiolites. Her extensive works on Ophiolites and study of the mantle slices and melt extraction and metasomatism recorded in the basal peridotites of Oman has been greatly acclaimed all over the world. She has collaborated with several geoscientists from all across the globe. Some Mary Python, Shoji Arai, and her works have left a footprint on us. Tomorrow, we shall be having her with us deliver a small lecture and trying to engrasp our minds with her extensive knowledge. I am greatly 
happy to announce that she is with us here today attending this lecture and i would like to thank you ma'am for providing us time tomorrow I will request everyone again to please wait patiently for a few more moments while we are resolving the issue. I would also like to remind everybody that tomorrow will be the culminating session of Geochron Chapter 1. We would again be reconvening on the 12th of September. With us, we will have Dr. Shumit Chakraborty from Ruru University at Pokham for a lecture on metamorphic petrology. We have planned a series of lectures over September, beginning on 12th September. We will be having with us various renowned speakers from all across the globe. We would be appreciated with your presence on the days. Hello. So, is it fine now? Yeah, yeah, fine. You, because once I disconnected, means I stopped sharing my screen. It was somehow created. Okay, okay, no problem, no problem. Sir. Okay, so uh, we have our questions now. Yeah. Uh, the first question, sir, is from Debarun Mukherjee, UG3, Presidency University. Mm -hmm. Why is there variability in seismic diagrams in Central America and Japan? How does it explain behavior of magma mixing, mantle wedge assimilation, and supra subduction zone volcanism at the back arc? See, uh, the behavior of the subducting slab is depending on uh, several factors. How the plate is underwent beneath another plate and uh, what is the angle of the subduction so uh, what is the speed of the of the of the of the plate so there are several factors and uh, also the thickness of the of the subducting uh, plate so uh, depending on that uh, the behavior of slab uh, is is changing and i think uh, because of that you can see uh, several uh, uh, different uh, uh, profiles of, of labs in different locations. So if you see the, the uh, Central America, you uh, will find that slab is directly going to the lower mantle even up to moving up to the, to the core mantle boundary. So material which is subducted to the lower mantle is, is uh, mixing with the lower uh, mantle material. And uh, if you see the uh, tomographic image beneath the Japan, your uh, material is, is mostly going up to the upper mantle and, and transition zone. So all these factors actually control the, the subduction process. Hello. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. Okay. So the next question is from uh, Mr. Shorboji Dash, research scholar at CSIR NGRI, India. In the 2D tomographic diagram, we saw that the lower mantle and outer core boundary is characterized by cold substances. But in the pressure temperature diagram, we also observed a sharp increase in temperature at the core mantle boundary. Is there any specific reason for this? Uh, not really, because because if you uh, see the uh, this uh, frame uh, this uh, diagram, so you will find that at the bottom of the of the part of the lower mantle, that is the core mantle boundary, the last 200 kilometer depth the profile is flat 
So basically, temperature profile is flat. So temperature is not increasing; it's uh, even decreasing. And this is mostly because people uh, believe that some of the of the uh, experimentalist and mineral physicists they believe that lots of or even even seismologists they believe that the some of the slab is is accumulating at the at the bottom of the of the lower mantle, and because of that you have a temperature gradient at the base of the lower mantle and uh, because of that if your slab temperature is definitely have a lower temperature than the surrounding mantle so there will be a temperature gradient there and uh, heat is is propagating from the from the outer core so basically uh, these uh, cold material will be easily melted and and it will uh, density of this uh, materials will be much lower than the surrounding mantle, and it will uh, move upward and percolate to the to the to the lower mantle or to the upper mantle, or even sometimes it comes to the surface. Also. Okay. Uh, so the next question is from Srijita Ghosh, uh, B.Sc. Third Year, Presidency University. Are there any evidences of carbonated mantle from meteorites or from bridgemanite studies? Bridgemanite studies. Yeah, bridgemanite is 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 uh, reported in 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 uh, um, several meteorites, and uh, even carbonates also reported in in uh, in uh, carbonates and uh, diamonds are reported from the from the meteorite. So it's it's possible, but but. Uh, you try to understand that the, these meteorites have a very high pressure and temperature condition, and carbonates are mostly uh, stable at a low temperature conditions. So, uh, um, uh, in most of the cases, uh, you don't find a carbonate very easily. Silicates and, and metals are very common in, in meteorites. Yeah. You you do find uh, uh, carbonates and diamonds in the Meteorites. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the next question is from Mr. Aryan K. Shashidharan, UG student, Hansraj College, India. Why kimberlites are in such cony shape? Uh, because uh, the uh, mostly because uh, it uh, ascend very fast. If you if you see the ascent rate of a kimberlite so in few hours it can reach from 300 km to the to the surface and uh, mostly uh, these uh, volcanoes are uh, contain a very uh, large amount of volatiles and uh, because of that this strange uh, funnel shape is, is forming but currently we do not have any uh, active kimberlite volcano so uh, mostly this is from the from the Jurassic or from the from the from the Proterozoic or like these ages. Yeah. Uh, the next one is from Miss Ipshita Chatterjee, PG student, the Maharaja Say uh, Sayajirao University of Varodra, India. How can we use experimental petrology in detecting minerals of lower familiarity, such as what cellulite from or uh, from meteorites? Can you repeat? I, I didn't uh, get your point. So yes, uh, yes, sure, sir. Uh, the question is, how can we use experimental petrology in detecting minerals of lower familiarity, such as what cellulite from meteorites? From experimental petrology, we can synthesize these these minerals in our lab, but we cannot extract this from the from the lower mantle. To extract this material, you need uh, either a uh, mantle xenolith or diamond inclusions or, or or yeah these only only uh, the the material which is is. Uh, uh, trapped in the in the uh, kimberlitic magnetism and coming to the surface. So if you have a uh, this kind of uh, volcanoes uh, in cer certain cratons, so you can get this kind of lower mantle or transition zone phases. 
but uh, definitely you can synthesize this very easily in the in the lab. Okay. Uh, the next question is from Shorboji Datta, PG two, Presidency University. How do you identify ringwoodite in the high pressure experimental rocks? Is it through microscope analysis or something else? And how do you differentiate mantle carbon from organic carbon? It's a very good question. Uh, it's it's very uh, 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 interesting question. So uh, what we generally do, we uh, try to uh, try to see the Raman spectra of the Olven phase because when you have a ringwoodite and if you go to if you analyze this ringwoodite using a uh, your SEM or, or uh, electron probe WDS, so you will get a, exactly the same composition as the olivine. So that will not give you uh, any confirmation that this is a polymer. Uh, this is a high pressure phase of olivine. So what we should do, we should take the sample to the Raman spectroscopy and we try to see the Raman peak of, of that particular polymorph of olivine and compare with the synthetic uh, ringwoodite data. And then uh, from this Raman data, we can easily confirm that it's a ringwoodite or it's a olivine or so as we are. And his second question was, uh, what was the second question? Yeah, so the second question uh, was, how do you differentiate between car uh, mantle carbon from organic carbon? Ah, if from the delta 13 carbon, you can easily distinguish. So if you if you uh, remember the, the the diagram which I have shown, so organic carbon will, will have a much lower value than the mantle carbon. So organic carbon would be minus 15 to minus 20. So if you measure the delta 13 carbon in your, your, your sample, you can easily distinguish if it's an organic or mantle. Mental carbon will be heavier than the organic carbon. Uh, so the next question is from Shohom Banerjee, Pass Out, Presidency University. How can you sharply categorize the different pressure temperature conditions at different depths within the mantle using these experimental procedures. As we know, there are several variations due to changes or anomalies in geothermal or geobaric gradients, like at the hot spots and the subduction zones. Uh, he is right that precisely we cannot measure the, the temperature Pressure calculation is relatively easier because uh, uh, we have a density data from, from the PREM uh, and uh, from that you can calculate the pressure. But uh, if you want to calculate the temperature, you have to see the, the phase transition at this different discontinuity. For example, if you take a pure iron and do a runner experiment at a core mental boundary or uh, inner core outer core boundary so you can just reduce the pressure slightly and if your material is is uh, melting so you can say that that uh, uh, this is the temperature where uh, inner core temperature would be or, or this is the temperature of the inner and outer core boundary would be so for so temperature you can you can measure at different discontinuity but uh, because diamond anvil cell or even a multi anvil cell, there is a huge temperature gradient. So precisely, you cannot tell about the temperature. Um, but uh, we hope that uh, the technology is developing day by day. So uh, whatever we have in a few years, we will have a much better constraint for for these discontinuities temperature. And pressure, we know precisely. So uh, if you know the Clapton slope of the something. Transition, you can easily calculate the pressure and density data also. And density data. Okay, so the next question is from Mr. Syed Bilal Hassan, PG student, Aligarh Muslim University. Does the subducting plate has any long-term effect on the temperature of mantle? Yeah. Uh, so if you your your slab is uh, subducted in the in the mantle. 
and uh, if you um, if your uh, subducting slab is staying in the mantle for longer time it will react with the ambient mantle it will react with the surrounding mantle and the temperature of the surrounding mantle is several hundred degrees higher than the subducting slab so whatever uh, hydrous phase or carbonate phase present in the slab will start melting and dehydration will start and decarbonation will start and from that you will produce lots of, of uh, H2O and CO2 rich fluid which will percolate to the upper mantle or to the mantle next to the slab and it will react with the mantle and produce some earth volcanism and some other volcanism. So it has a uh, okay, so the next question we have from Mr. Gaurav Sinha, Maha, uh, Gaurav Sinha Mahapatra, UG student, Jagannath Kishore College, Purulia. How is the correlation done between the observations in nature and the experiments conducted in the laboratory and also with the hypothetically proposed model? Oh. Exactly, he is asking, but uh, uh, we mostly in, in uh, Earth is, is inaccessible, so we do not know much about uh, the deeper part of the mantle because we do not have any direct sample. So, but we have a seismological observation. So what we do as an experiment is we, we perform an experiment and we try to, to understand whatever physical properties we know from the seismic data it matches with our experimental data or not. And from that, we try to understand more about the, the interior of the Earth. So I think um, if we perform more experiment at high pressure and high temperature condition and compare with the, with the seismological data, I think uh, we get uh, better constraint on the on the interior of the world. Uh, okay, so the next question uh, we have from Shinjon Roy, PG2, Presidency University. What role does subduction has on the 660 kilometer discontinuity? Yeah, this is a very interesting question because when you have uh, the slab that is subducted and goes to the 660, either it stagnates and or it will go further and go to the lower mantle. Suppose if your slab is stagnant at 660 kilometer discontinuity, so basically your, your temperature is much lower than the surrounding mantle. That is a peritrophic composition. And subducting slab composition is a massive composition. So if you remember my slide of Duina diamond, so in that diamond, uh, I have shown you the mineral volume proportion. And in this volume proportion, the mineralogy is completely different in your uh, basaltic composition compared to the your peritrophic composition. So uh, it will have a uh, very huge effect on the on the uh, uh, on the uh, the location of the 660. So it can actually move to the much lower uh, depth. So uh, in peritrophic composition, mostly you have a 660 at 660. But if a basalt is accumulated at 660, then your this phase transition this ringwoodite to perovskite will change to garnet to bridgmanite or garnet to magnesium perovskite. So it will shift to the much lower pressure. So your depth of 660 can be detected at much lower pressure. That is a 700 kilometer or 720 kilometer pressure. And, uh, and seismologists are getting this kind of signal. Okay, so the next question we have from Mr. Rahul Mahavar, faculty, Bastar University, India. Do we have any study which have composition correlation with meteorite from D double prime layer? 
have to write is the extra terrestrial material and D double prime is from the lower mantle. So definitely we do not have any any uh, such correlation. Uh, but we can we can um, I understand what he's trying to ask. Basically, uh, his question is is related to post perovskite. It's still, uh, we do not have any uh, post perovskite uh, uh, transition in meteorites so far. So, who knows? Maybe some meteorites can have a post perovskite. So, we cannot correlate with a B double prime layer, but uh, if Definitely, uh, perovskite is, is magnesium perovskite, which is now called as a rosmanite, is present in, in several meteorites. Uh, so, we have one more question from uh, Debarun Mukherjee of UG3, President's University. Recent studies have shown inclusion of water in larger proportions that are often extracted in form of volatiles to hydrate the lower mantle. How does a carbonated mantle fit into the parameters of such studies? The deep water cycle and deep carbon cycle, they are two different things. So when we, we talk about water, water is, 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 can be present in phosylite, it can be present in ringwoodite, and all the water, suppose whatever water we have at the surface, three or four times more water we can accumulate at the, at the transition zone. So basically transition zone is, is behaving like a sponge. A lot of water can be accumulated, but locally. And uh, when we talk about carbonate, carbonate, if you see the peridotite, in peridotite you do not have any, any carbon phase. In peridotite only four phases are stable. That is your olivine or its polymorph, garnet, and two pyroxene. So there is no carbonate. But if there is a, is a place where you have a carbonate in the interior of the earth, it will, it will depending on the, on, the, on the pressure, temperature, and oxygen free gas, it, will, it will, will change to carbonate, or it will change to diamond, or it will change to uh, carbide or metal phase, depending on, on what kind of fugacity mental has. So if it, if it's very reduced, then diamond can be stable or carbide can be stable. And if mantle is very oxidized, suppose if uh, there is a subducting slab and subducting slab creates lots of uh, increases of fugacity, oxygen fugacity. So your, your uh, uh, carbonatitic melt or some carbonate, these can be stable. So depending on what mantle oxygen fugacity we have, and, and people are working a lot uh, for, for knowing the, the oxygen fugacity of the deep mantle, and, uh, and now we have better data for the deep mantle, but still we need to know more in the future. Uh, okay, so we have one last question. We'll, uh, uh, it's from Tibendu Shorkar, PG student, Presidency University, India. Some work on high pressure metamorphism suggests that for exhumation process, there, the, uh, the stishovite present in rock indicates the 660 kilometer depth where the lithosphere had gone. Is it possible? Uh, metamorphism is, is mostly a very low pressure and low temperature condition. Uh, stishovite is, uh, there is another transition in, in quartz. Uh, I think at, uh, at, is, uh, uh, at much higher pressure, 40 GP or something. Uh, but uh, tissue white could be stable in the, in the transition zone. But I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Uh, okay. Thank you, sir. With that, we come to the end of our question and answer session. We apologize for the questions that we haven't been able to attend owing to the time constraint. Hope you'll uh, me and uh, I would be happy to answer their question. And yeah, I that would be a uh, better option. Yeah, we can. Uh, yes, sir. We can forward you the questions that uh, are left, and you might. Okay. So now we have. 
almost come to the end of today's session of Geocron 2020. We express our gratitude to Dr. Shujay Kanti Ghosh for taking out the time from his busy schedule to be with us here today. Once again, thank you so much, sir. We are eager to maintain this relationship of love amongst us, and we hope to have you in the future for any such lecture session or workshop. Please visit our department uh, if you ever happen to be in Kolkata. Yeah, sure, sure. Yes, and, uh, now we'll just take a screenshot to preserve the memory of this session. Uh, please keep your microphones off. done we are done with having the screenshot thank you so much thank you so much to everyone thank you sir thank you. for this wonderful lecture once again and thank you to all our audience hope to see you all uh, as we reconvene tomorrow at 11 a.m till then adieu and have a nice day thank you so much wonderful talk Sujay. excellent talk Hello? Yes, sir. Should I, should I uh, cancel my call or somebody wants to ask? Sir, you might, you might, yes, sir. Sure, sir. You might. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you for being here with us. Thank you, sir, for the really wonderful session. The session was really good. Sir. Thank you, sir, for taking our questions. We are very thankful to you. Thank you. Thank you. If anyone have any questions, I'll